There are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. But there are also unknown knowns. We are the ancient and esoteric order of the Jackalope, a secret society devoted to unearthing and sharing this forgotten knowledge. When I was a child, we took a family trip to the Independent Seaport Museum in Philadelphia. One of the featured attractions there is the USS Olympia, once the pride of the U.S. fleet. Bolted to the deck by the wheelhouse are two brass footprints engraved with the following text. From this spot, Commodore Dewey directed the Asiatic Squadron to victory in the Spanish-American War, launching the United States onto the world stage. You may fire when you are ready, Gridley. May 1st, 1898, Manila Bay, Luzon, Philippines. Those are famous words, some of the most famous in naval history, right up there with don't give up the ship and damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. But who are they addressed to? Who is Gridley? He fired when ready, presented by number 13. In 1860, Charles Vernon Gridley of Hillsdale, Michigan was sponsored for the U.S. Naval Academy by his congressman, Henry Waldron. Young Gridley attained no particular distinction and graduated in the bottom half of his class, but he was well-regarded and popular and somehow picked up the nickname Steve. Upon graduation in 1864, he was assigned to serve as an ensign on the USS Oneida under Commander J.R.M. Mullaney. The Oneida was then part of Admiral David Farragut's blockading squadron in the Gulf of Mexico. When Gridley arrived, the Union Navy's primary goal was to take the city of Mobile, Alabama, cutting off Confederate access to the Gulf of Mexico. That's how Gridley saw his first real action in the Battle of Mobile Bay on August 5, 1864. Before the Union fleet could engage the Confederate Navy in the bay, it first had to maneuver through the main channel, avoiding Confederate mines and a near-constant bombardment from the batteries at Fort Morgan. Farragut's battle plan was twofold. First, he would send in a column of ironclads to soak up enemy fire. Behind them, the wooden vessels would creep by, lashed together in a sort of naval buddy system. The Oneida was one of the last ships to pass through the channel. Gridley was stationed in the ship's forecastle in an exposed position to help the ship navigate through the smoke and spot any mines that hadn't been set off by the rest of the fleet. During the passage, the Oneida came under heavy fire, both from Fort Morgan and the guns of the CSS Tennessee. The ship took serious damage, but was pulled to safety by its partner, the USS Galena. Gridley's commanding officer later declared his conduct to be above all praise, which was a feather in the young officer's cap. Mobile Bay was the last major naval operation in the Gulf during the war. After the South surrendered, Gridley showed some kindness and gallantry to his defeated foes when he went over and above the call of duty to assure safe passage to a group of ex-Confederates exiled to Mexico. The period after the Civil War was a tough time for the U.S. Navy. The war had left the Navy with more officers than it needed, and decades of peace presented few opportunities for those officers to distinguish themselves. It was not unheard of for officers to spend a decade or more stuck at the rank of ensign. Ambitious academy graduates were left with few options except to wait for their seniors to retire or die, or to play the games of politics and patronage to advance their careers. Fortunately for Gridley, during the mustering out immediately after the war, he rapidly rose to the rank of lieutenant commander, giving him a comfortable position from which to play the waiting game. After five years sailing the South Seas on the USS Broken and the USS Kearsage, Gridley was transferred to the USS Michigan in 1871. The Michigan was ostensibly meant to patrol the Great Lakes and keep our northern border safe from perfidious Canadians, but the harsh winter kept it anchored in Erie, Pennsylvania almost half the year. While wintering in Erie, Gridley met and married Harriet Vincent, the eldest daughter of prominent local judge John P. Vincent. Steve and Hattie seemed to be very much in love, and it certainly didn't hurt that his new father-in-law had a position of influence, which could not only help Gridley's career, but also secure patronage jobs for his mother and brother. After two years in the Michigan, Gridley returned to the South Atlantic aboard the USS Monongahela and then did stints as an instructor at the Naval Academy and as the executive officer of the USS Trenton in Europe. He also served as the inspector of the 10th Lighthouse District for four years, a post almost certainly secured for him by his father-in-law in order to keep him close to his wife and family, which had grown to include three children by 1880, Ruth, Catherine, and John. In 1892, Gridley received his first command, the USS Marion. His two-year Asian tour with the Marion would have been uneventful, if it weren't for an unexpected typhoon that had to be weathered at its very end. Then it was back to Erie for another three-year tour of duty as lighthouse inspector. Finally, in 1897, Gridley was promoted to the rank of captain and given command of the USS Olympia, the flagship of the Asiatic Squadron. The Olympia was one of the most modern ships in the Navy at the time and considered to be a highly desirable posting. Gridley proved to be a popular commander, somehow managing to run a tight ship without having to be a strict disciplinarian. And then on February 15, 1898, the USS Maine exploded while anchored at Havana, Cuba. The U.S. and Spain had been at each other's throats for months. The U.S. public was resentful of the heavy-handed tactics the Spanish had been using to put down popular uprisings in the Caribbean. 
The U.S. government and business interests were covetous of Spain's colonial possessions, and the Spanish were just sick of U.S. hypocrisy and moralizing. Once the main exploded, it was war. The commander of the Asiatic Squadron, Commodore George Dewey, had been preparing for war for months. He knew the Spanish fleet in the Pacific was weak and vulnerable, and that if he moved quickly, he could strike the first blow and severely weaken Spain. When war was declared, he moved decisively. He almost did it without Gridley, though. For months, Gridley had been ill, suffering from dysentery and an unspecified liver condition. Some days, he could barely leave his bed. But if the fleet was going into battle, Gridley was determined to be with it. He'd gone 33 years between battles and was getting old. Who knows how many chances he would have for glory and promotion. He pled with Dewey to let him stay on. Dewey relented. Under cover of darkness on April 30th, Dewey sailed the entire squadron past the batteries on Corregidor and into Manila Bay. The Spanish were not expecting the Americans to make a move at night, and so their ships were anchored at Cavite, a small peninsula which provided them protection from the weather and tides. On May 1st, as the sun rose, they were surprised to find themselves bottled up by the entire Asiatic squadron. There was nowhere to go, and they were too far away from the city to receive effective support from the shore batteries. At 5.41 a.m., Dewey turned to his captain and gave a brief and formal order. You may fire when you are ready, Gridley. Fire he did. The Battle of Manila Bay was a one-sided slaughter. Outgunned and under-armored, the only real hope for the Spanish was to ram American vessels, but concentrated fire tactics made that impossible. In fact, the only hiccup in the American battle plan came at 7.45 a.m., when a garbled message from his quartermaster forced Gridley to message Dewey that only 15 rounds of ammunition remained per gun. The squadron retreated to the middle of the bay and had an impromptu breakfast for the enlisted men while ammunition was counted. When it was discovered that, in fact, only 15 rounds of ammunition had been expended per gun, breakfast was put to an end and the action resumed. At 12.40 p.m., after seven hours of battle, the Spanish surrendered. Their fleet had been annihilated. The Asiatic squadron suffered few casualties, but Gridley was one of them. The heat and poor ventilation in the ship's conning tower exacerbated his existing medical condition. At one point in the battle, he hit his side on the edge of the chart table, causing him excruciating pain. After the battle, he had to be carried away from his post. As the month wore on, it became clear that his condition was deteriorating rapidly, and Dewey had no choice but to relieve him of command. On May 25th, he was sent home aboard the USS Zafiro to receive medical treatment. Two days later, he was transferred from the Zafiro to a commercial steamer, the Occidental and Oriental Steamship Company's Coptic, which was bound for Japan. On June 4th, when the Coptic reached Nagasaki, Gridley discovered that he and Dewey were the men of the hour. He gave a British newspaper reporter a short interview, tinged with a little bitterness. He did not see a future for the U.S. and the Philippines, seeing the islands as little more than a backwater suitable for a rest stop for fleets crossing the Pacific. Still, he had no regrets, saying, The Battle of Manila killed me, but I would do it again if necessary. Those were Gridley's last words on the public record. He died on June 5th while the Coptic was anchored in Kobe. His body was cremated in Yokohama and the ashes were sent on to his widow in Erie and interred at Lakeside Cemetery with great fanfare. The Navy later placed four guns captured from the Spanish arsenal at Cavite by his graveside. Fifteen years later, the people of Erie celebrated Gridley once again by naming a municipal park after him. In the center of Gridley Park is a simple ionic column standing tall. At its base are two plaques recounting the details of Gridley's service and death, made from metal recovered from the wreckage of the USS Maine. So what's the appeal of Gridley? He was well-liked by all, but not particularly regarded for his gallantry, military acumen, or initiative. He provided years of service to his country, but achieved little distinction. His only real claim to fame was that he was standing next to the man of the hour when that man's moment finally came. Even the Battle of Manila Bay itself was largely a meaningless victory. The Spanish fleet never really had a chance, and the U.S. lacked the strength to take and hold the Philippines themselves. In fact, they spent most of the next three months trying to stop the Germans from taking them. And yet Dewey's famous order has secured Gridley's place in the history books for eternity. In addition to his park in Erie, he's also lent his name to four ships in the U.S. Navy, a type of destroyer, and a National Guard training camp in Pennsylvania. His alma mater, Hillsdale College, added a seashell to their coat of arms to honor his service. For someone who did relatively little, he made the most out of what little he did, or would have had he lived. But maybe that's part of Gridley's mystique. He's a well-regarded heroic figure who died at the peak of his fame. He never had the chance to disappoint the public or to be revealed as a lucky mediocrity like Dewey. He's too big to be built up, but too small to bother tearing down. In hindsight, he's a man who seemed to have been destined to be a footnote. He Fired When Ready was researched, written, performed, and produced by David White for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope and is released under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. The script of this episode, with the references and links, can be found on our website at orderofthejackalope.com. 
Keep up with our production schedule by following us at Order Jackalope on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Hey, want to join the fastest growing secret society in the nation? Of course you do. But before you can be initiated into the secret mysteries, you've got to share a mystery of your own. Visit our website at orderthejackalope.com and click join us for more details.